Okay. Um, as we have a very tight uh, time frame, I would like to start at uh, 5.30 sharp. Uh, so uh, welcome uh, everyone. I think uh, some people will still call in uh, during, during the session. Um, uh, today's energy talks and drinks is a bit different than the ones we did before because for this, this one uh, we teamed up with Maritime Delta. Um, I've been in, uh, uh, in contact with Tessa for the past few weeks and we found out that we were working on the same topic. So why not partner up to combine knowledge and create more support? And today's event is one in a series of two, covering floating systems and specifically floating solar. And for the next session, we will focus on floating wind. Um, before we move over to our moderator for today, which is Bob Meyer from TKE, uh, Tessa from Innovation Quarter will tell you a bit more about the Maritime Delta program. Um, Tessa, I would like to hand it over to you. Thank you so much. I will uh, share my screen with you. Um, and show you what uh, Maritime Delta does. Yes. So Maritime Delta is a program that we uh, have together with uh, Netherlands Maritime Technology and we, I mean, Innovation Quarter. We, um, we have this program to uh, strengthen the collaboration um, between uh, governments uh, the market and also knowledge institutes and uh, that is very important for our sector uh, the maritime sector because we are uh, responsible for more than 70,000 jobs and uh, here you can see that uh, in the old days we used to have uh, a lot of uh, activities we used to do a lot of network activities uh, we would have met in, uh, in person and here you can see a picture of our dinner that we have uh, where 80 people were at a, not at a 1.5 1 meter distance. And we would talk about um, innovation and how to strengthen and increase uh, the, the strength of this maritime cluster and how we can work together and how we can um, focus more uh, the program focuses on uh, three subjects, uh, the energy transition, human capital and uh, digitalization. And also this subject today, uh, floating solar is, uh, is one of the subjects that uh, we find very interesting and uh, for the future. So I would uh, like to give the word to our moderator, Bob Meyer. He is the director of TKI Wind and um, he will take it away. Well, thank you, uh, Tessa and Ashley, for uh, the introduction. Um, and we've got a full program uh, this afternoon. Um, I will uh, share my screen with some more introductory slides, uh, but then uh, from my side, just one moment. And that's not the right screen. Okay. And it should be in full screen now. I hope that it works. Uh, yes. Good. Um, so um, for a start, uh, what you see on this picture is uh, the Borsele Alpha uh, substation from Tenet um, uh, that is now being uh, 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 is made operational. And the first power is being transported uh, over that uh, substation. But it's an interesting uh, picture because, uh, of course, for now, it's all wind turbines being connected to the offshore grid. Uh, but of course, for the longer term future, we're looking at uh, many other applications, including, of course, uh, floating solar uh, to be connected to the offshore grid as well. And maybe not in, in this area, but in, in future areas uh, for development. Uh. So, um, uh, as uh, Tessa said, I, my name is Bob Meyer. I'm the director of the TKI Wind op Zee, uh, TKI Offshore Wind. Uh, so you could say, well, what's he doing here with offshore solar? Um, but there's a good explanation for that, and I'll come to that in a, in a second. Um, what you, uh, just as a brief introduction of what the TKI uh, Wind op Zee is, we are uh, a mission-oriented uh, innovation program targeting renewable offshore energy. So that's more than offshore wind. Uh, in fact, it, is, it covers uh, also uh, floating solar, 
and potentially also other technologies in the future uh, if that will be opportune. Um, we, uh, a lot of companies have uh, uh, become a, a member, a partner of the TKI. There are now over 170 uh, organizations that have joined us. Uh, we've got a research portfolio uh, of roughly uh, 300 uh, uh, projects with a total R&D value of 350 million. And uh, that is being expanded uh, every year uh, with uh, considerable effort from uh, industry, uh, but also from knowledge organizations uh, and, and universities. Uh, and uh, the work that we do there is, uh, is knowledge development, uh, many times in joint industry projects, uh, uh, but also product development. Um, and uh, now this innovation program is uh, tied to uh, the Dutch climate agreement. And um, if uh, I'm not going to expand on that, we all know what that is. Um, but uh, part of that uh, climate agreement is that we uh, increase, uh, say, the, the production of renewable energies uh, drastically over the, uh, the coming period. And uh, what we see is that up to the year 2030, that uh, is all uh, well feasible. Um, but after that, the uh, increase, the annual increase, and also the total volumes become so large that there will be some uh, issues that we have to address. And uh, these issues are still in the area of cost, uh, cost of generation of uh, renewable power. Um, we, we must keep the energy transition affordable, um, but also the, uh, the integration of enormous amounts of uh, electricity that's being generated offshore into our energy system. Um, another area is uh, the limits in, um, in space. And so we have to integrate all these activities uh, in the North Sea, which is uh, quite busy, uh, but also uh, without uh, negative impact to the environment and maybe even a possible uh, positive contribution uh, to the environment. Uh, now the scope of the innovation program, as I said, uh, is, is not uh, only wind. A large part of it is offshore wind because it's in a more mature state um, than other technologies offshore. Um, and uh, what's, uh, what you see here is that the, the are sort of research areas uh, that we uh, address, but uh, you see there also explicitly floating solar and uh, of course, this is more in the uh, initial stages where we're currently piloting and, uh, and uh, also learning by doing, but also developing a lot of new knowledge in projects that you'll see more uh, on uh, in the coming, uh, uh, in, in, the, in these presentations that will follow. So, um, the, um, uh, as I said, the, the, the program uh, includes uh, floating solar, um, and it also implies that we are actively uh, uh, supporting from the top sector energy, TKI Wind op Zee is part of the top sector energy. We're also actively supporting these projects, uh, for example, with uh, innovation subsidies. Uh, okay, um, now for the information that you are here for uh, uh, today, we got uh, a program um, uh, with many interesting presentations. Uh, you've, you've seen the, uh, the program. Um, uh, I would like to now to uh, hand over to, uh, to William Otto, uh, who's Senior Project Manager of Marin, uh, who will take us into the world of floating systems uh, and creating resilient cities. I'll stop sharing my screen so you can take it over, William. Thank you, Bob, for the nice uh, introduction. So my name is uh, William Otto, working at uh, Marin. So how's the sound? Can everyone hear me? Absolutely. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, so I'm working uh, like nine or 10 years at, uh, at Marin and uh, in the offshore department. We, we, we test all kind of uh, floating uh, structures moored uh, at sea. Uh, I've been working a lot for oil and gas, but in the last couple of years, I could focus on, on two things actually. One is uh, floating building ground and the other one is uh, floating solar. Um, Actually, Buchner asked me to talk about the first subject uh, today. So I will be talking uh, about uh, uh, floating building ground. And then, uh, as you have seen uh, after me, uh, there will be three uh, presentations about uh, floating solar. So now I will try to share my screen. Uh, yeah. Share. It's visible. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, 
Um, I have about uh, 10 to 15 minutes and um, I would like to, to, uh, to tell you something about uh, three projects. One is the, uh, the Space and Sea project, which actually has come to an end uh, in um, uh, last, uh, last Monday. So that was a big uh, EU uh, project. Another uh, project uh, I would like to give uh, some insight in is the hybrid energy of uh, TIP we are working on. And lastly, I want to tell something about the NWA, which is Nationale Wetenschapsagenda in, uh, in Dutch. And uh, they have uh, new, uh, new calls, very uh, interesting on, uh, on this topic. So about this Space at Sea project, it has just uh, become to an end uh, on last Monday. Uh, the, it was an EU Horizon 2020 call. Um, and the call tax was something like, yeah, we see more uh, majority of the population uh, living in coastal areas. Uh, there's becoming a lack of space uh, at uh, the coasts. Uh, and at the same time, we see uh, increasing sea levels. Well, uh, not only in coastal areas, it's getting more busy, but also actually at sea itself. Uh, uh, you're creating uh, a lot of uh, renewable energy, but uh, as Bob explained, uh, we, we want to do more in the coming decades uh, uh, of that. Uh, transport herbs and uh, aquaculture uh, also um, uh, not so big at the moment, but um, uh, th there, there is a, definitely a need to, to, to increase that kind of activities at sea. And therefore there was this EU Horizon 2020 call uh, about enabling technologies uh, for which this uh, Space at Sea project was, uh, was uh, made. So, three years ago, uh, we started this project with an uh, objective, uh, provide sustainable and affordable workspace at sea by developing uh, standardized and cost-efficient modular uh, islands, floating islands with uh, low ecological impact. And here you can see all the partners who have worked on that uh, project. So the idea was a uh, floating building ground and it has to be uh, uh, flexible. And that is actually a, one of the biggest, uh, or maybe not the biggest, but it's a big advantage of building floating. Like uh, the concept is uh, coupled pontoons, so interconnected barges. Um, and it's like Lego, you, you can have barges uh, with, uh, with uh, 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 an energy hub or, or living modules, uh, farming or ports, so the logistics part, and um, interconnect those barges to form one assembly. Uh, assembly is then a floating island. Um, and then the idea is that such, such an assembly, if, if you standardize the, the floaters, then, then you can, can build cities by adding on modules and reshuffling if, if the demand changes and even uh, relocate if, 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 uh, if these modules are, 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 uh, are needed elsewhere. So that was uh, uh, the plan. And uh, last month we had this, this uh, demonstrator in our uh, offshore basin. So what you see here is, is, is a combination of a big uh, logistic port. So you see a uh, floating uh, uh, container terminal, uh, but I think you can see my mouse here. Yeah? yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, attached to that container in the terminal is, 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 is a, a, a living area uh, energy hub uh, and, and here a, 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 an area dedicated for the, for the uh, aquaculture. So, uh, uh, the, the, the idea was, well, these, uh, we've developed a standardized floater to, which can be interconnected. And of course, this, this combination you see here um, is, is maybe not the, the first combination that, that, that will, will be utilized or put in, into application, like, like the, 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 floating, uh, build, the floating city. Basically, we'll first start uh, near shore as expansion of, of, of existing cities, like, like, like 
Singapore to Monaco, expanding their 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 their, their city uh, into the sea on these floating modules, uh, but but by making these float floats standardized and interconnectable, you you can uh, gradually grow and and maybe uh, in the far future end up with an assembly like like you see here in this uh, in this demonstrator. So. Um, a lot of things has been done in this in this project, like we had architects and logistics people and 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 and, and shipyards, and they all worked on on, on parts of this 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 uh, floating uh, development. And at Marin, of course, we looked at at yeah, how does it move? Quite an important question. What are the forces in these these connectors, and and what are the forces in in the mooring to the to the seabed? Well, for that. We first had to create uh, tools, uh, numerical tools to, to, to predict motions. So here you see uh, in test lines, uh, uh, test results and, and, and in solid lines, uh, calculated results about how, how these things uh, move. And as you can imagine, when we started this project, uh, uh, no, no tools were available how to predict the motions of, of interconnected pontoons on such a large uh, scale. And um, yeah, while working on this project, uh, we also realized, of course, while we are doing this now for floating building grounds, but if you think about a lot of floating solar concepts, also the topic of today, then um, the solutions also tend to interconnected floaters and then not two or three like we see in Austria nowadays, but, 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 but dozens or hundreds of them. So these tools are also used for, uh, for, for, uh, for floating solar. So when we could actually predict these motions and, and then the predict the, the, these forces, we also could learn a bit uh, about how, how, how do these, uh, the, the, these uh, floaters move. And um, actually, what, what, what we could see is, is like really the waveward side of the island is, is moving along with the waves, but going more and more leeward, the, the island is, is, is getting uh, more steady, more still. And basically, what we could uh, deduce was, this is coming from the fact that, that the incoming wave is, is diffracting on the, on the waveward side. So, uh, uh, Cancelling the, the, the excitation of the wave uh, on, on, on the leeward side, huh? uh, and, and therefore you get you get the, the, the wave coming in and being uh, deflected, so actually reflected into the ocean, giving a very favorable motion of the island uh, on the leeward side, and, and, and some degree of motion which which, uh, which is manageable at at the, at the waveward side. So what we also did in this project was look, well, how can we improve those kind of floaters? Huh? So we've looked at uh, maybe uh, different drafts and uh, uh, like what we really could see was the effect of the draft. You can mainly see that in the force, the axial force of the connectors, like basically the lighter you, you make it, so the, the shallower the draft becomes, the lighter you make it, the, the, the lesser the force in axial direction becomes uh, in, these, in these connections between the, between the pontoons. However, in vertical direction, that, that, that doesn't help because in vertical direction it's just these barges, they want to pit and they, they pit independently. The connector tries to keep it together and the draft has not really influence into that. We also looked at different shapes. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, squares are not so uh, uh, friendly for the connectors, especially not in, uh, in oblique waves. Uh, triangles are much more friendly for, for oblique wave, for the connectors uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, oblique waves. So first we tested the triangular island, but we ended up with, with these squares, like, like, like the, the couple of pontoons, they are interconnected squares. So why did we do that in the end? Well, as I mentioned, we had a consortia with architects and logistical experts and, and societal experts. And in the end, 
a triangle is from, from, from my expertise in hydrodynamics, the best, but for usability, um, the, the deck space could not efficiently be used. So basically you have a, a, a very elegant, useless uh, floater. Uh, and that uh, was maybe not the, the, the best uh, choice. So therefore, in the end, the higher interconnector forces were accepted basically in order for a better uh, usability. Yeah. So as I only have uh, 10 to 15 minutes, I'm going through this quickly. Like, like we have learned how to predict these motions. Uh, you see that the motions are not so sensitive to the draft, but the fender forces are. Like we can provide shelter to leeward modules by, 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 by putting uh, modules uh, in the front. And like, and um, yeah, I think one of the key finding is coupled, coupled uh, barges, like interconnected pontoons, they always tend to follow the waves unless you make the pontoon size, the individual pontoon size uh, uh, large enough. And then large is something you should see with respect to the wavelength view you want to encounter. So we've learned uh, that uh, in the space at sea concept can, can really work in lakes and near shore environments and when it's a bit protected, but really at the North Sea interconnected pontoons without any protection, that, uh, that is a challenge. So therefore, this is a, a, a follow-up project, so to say, where we look for energy hubs uh, in the North Sea for O&M of, of wind farms, but maybe o also O&M of floating solar in the future, in which we, we, we call it a hybrid island. So it is not, not landfill, it is not uh, floating, but it's a combination of partly landfill or uh, reclaimed and partially uh, floating. And you have the benefit of the floating that you can make it flexible, interchangeable, you can make it grow easily but you also have the protection of the, 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 the sand wheel that, that is providing shelter to the, to, the, um, to the floating part. So that is the hybrid energy uh, project which is running now uh, with, uh, with a number of partners. So lastly, I, I, I want to, to briefly mention to you a, a call we are working on about the floating future. This is mainly done by my colleague uh, Olaf Waals, but also Rutger de Graaf from uh, Bureau 21. Um, and, and basically this NWA call is saying, well, if you look to the Netherlands, then you see a couple of things combined. Really high population density, but also high economic density. That's of course because there are a lot of people, but also li uh, high livestock density. On the same, and if you look at how low our land is, well, that is, uh, we all know that we are called the lowlands, of course. Uh, well, the quality of our uh, air is also not so good in this region. So this NVR has called the call, how can we keep our densely populated country more livable? And then we, of course, are thinking about, about these, these floating uh, uh, solutions um because uh this with this you can really provide more resilient uh, uh building space then we're thinking inland so floating building grounds maybe on Aimeer, Markemeer, uh but also uh, at sea so near shore mass fracture 2.5 maybe um and and like i said these energy herbs in, in in the wind parks but then with a a a, a partially reclaimed uh, part to, to, to provide shelter. Um, I think one of the key things is, if you think about the energy transition, no one knows how the energy landscape looks like in 20 years. So if you build something now, then you must be sure that, that what you build can be adjusted, uh, adapted to, 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 to the things we don't know, because we don't know if it will be hydrogen or uh, or ammonia or another energy carrier. Um, and with these floating parts, which you can, uh, which you can relocate and interchange, you, you buy more flexibility. So um, this is basically how this NVR call looks like. 
And what I want to say to you is, um, we have good connections with university and with other um, uh, research partners. And now we are also looking for industry partners who, who want to, to back us up in this call. Um, if you have the time, I will leave it to this uh, and give the, the word back to Bob. Well, thanks very much, uh, William, for an absolutely fascinating presentation about the floating future. Uh, let's uh, have a look at the chat if there are any questions uh, from the audience uh, for you. Uh, I see there's a question from uh, Michael. Uh, William, how are floating islands connected to the land? To the land? Yeah. So um, uh, it, it depends, like, um, with the, the, the um, near your city expansion I was talking about. Uh, then we are really uh, uh, thinking on, 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 on bridges, uh, but then a bit more flexible than the concrete ones we, we know nowadays. Um, but if you are thinking about uh, uh, um, like such an offshore island I was describing for, for O and M uh, purposes, then uh, then it is uh, of course um, uh, uh, crew transfer vessels going back and forth. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's another question um, uh, from uh, Sebastian. Uh, uh, what do you see as the most pressing scientific issues that need to be resolved uh, uh, to, uh, to make this happen? Um, well, uh, it, it depends if you go to, 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 uh, to, to NIST or city expansion, then I think it's not so much uh, scientific uh, challenges, but more practical and organization, organizational and financial uh, uh, challenges. Because uh, for these niche or city expansions, uh, well, it can be that I'm, I'm, I'm missing something, but, but like the scientific challenges are, are, are not, are not, 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 um, not uh, preventing the development. But if you talk about what we see here on the on, on the on the uh, on the screen, like like like, like really offshore uh, uh, floating, um, then I think yeah, academically and scientifically, on on the one hand, if you want to have good uh, favorable motion response of the island, then you want to have the individual size of the the pontoons uh, uh, as big as possible, basically. Uh, on the other hand, uh, that, that also comes with huge forces inside, uh, the, 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 inside the construction, especially bending moments. Um, and yeah, looking for ways to, to alleviate that and, and making that, that the, the right uh, balance, um, that, 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 that is a, um, that would be, uh, a challenge and also an, an, an enabler for uh, for this development. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks uh, for answering this. And there are still a couple of questions uh, in the chat and see how far we can uh, go with the, the time. Uh, if a question that you raise is not answered, we can always uh, answer them uh, later on uh, outside uh, the this event. Um, yeah. Also, yeah. the presentations uh, will be shared uh, later on. Yeah. And the contact uh, information uh, of all the presenters will be there. Uh, so it's always possible to, uh, uh, to send an email uh, uh, to, to raise your question again. Um, so one of the questions that we can still tackle um, is, uh, do you have any recommendations? That's from, uh, from Jan. Do you have any recommendations for floating solar uh, for near and offshore um, uh, if you use these structures? Um, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I, th I think there, there are a lot of similar similarities. Um, with floating solar, uh, the, 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 the uh, motion aspect is not so important as it is for, for these floating cities. Uh, I think uh, uh, the PP panels, they, 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 they suffer a bit uh, energy yield if it moves, but uh, that's maybe dealable. So for floating solar, I can say, how uh, the, the more compliant you can make it such that, that it moves along with the waves instead of fighting, instead of fighting the waves, that, that, that would really give it, um, um, that would really reduce the interconnector loads. Yeah, mm. yeah. So uh, 
uh, a good finding of this floating building ground is axial loads, the less draft, so the less mass you give it, the better it becomes. And floating solar is, of course, really light. So interconnectors in axial direction can, 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 floating, uh, can benefit from that with floating solar because floating solar uh, PV panels may be like 10 kilograms a square meter, something like that. Um, but, but for the vertical motions, yeah, the more you can allow it and the less you fight it, I would say the better. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a good recommendation and uh, see if it also works out in, uh, in practical solutions uh, there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There are more questions in the chat, but we have to, uh, to stop now because of time. Uh, we got uh, the next presenter lined up. So, William, uh, many thanks for uh, this interesting presentation. Um, and if you can stop sharing your screen, yeah. um, despite the nice uh, floating future picture uh, that we see, um, then we'd like to hand over to, uh, to Wim Soppe from uh, TNO. Wim, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can hear you. And I will try to share my screen with you. Um, let me see how to do that. Share screen. Multiple participants can share simultaneously or one participant. What do we have to choose? Well, I do yeah. now have uh, several options. If you just click the, the center of the button, the share screen, you should directly go to the... Okay. Yes, perfect. This is working, yeah. Um, right. So, okay, thank you, Bob, uh, for introducing me and uh, thank you for the uh, Buccaneer host uh, to invite me for this uh, talk and give me the uh, opportunity to uh, present the um, Solar at Sea concept to this community. Um, it's uh, about uh, a flexible offshore PV concept. Uh, before I will introduce this uh, concept uh, for uh, offshore floating PV further to you, uh, I would uh, I'd like to start with um, yeah, the motivation to go offshore any, anyway. Uh, the main motivation to look for offshore as a location for uh, PV is um, space. Uh, in order to achieve uh, the energy transition in the Netherlands, we need to install a lot, lot more of uh, PV. And um, yeah, the no regret options are, co are of course, um, to install PV on, on roofs of houses and uh, industrial buildings, but that is uh, going slowly and it's also limited. Uh, we see um, an increasing uh, uh, amount of installations on uh, land, large uh, PV systems on land, uh, but uh, they are also facing um, some opposition uh, because um, well, they influence uh, the, yeah, the, the uh, environment somehow, at least visually. Um, and that is the main reason that uh, we look, um, yeah, because of space, we look at uh, offshore locations to install PV. Um, some secondary motivations uh, could be that uh, the yield of PV uh, offshore could be somewhat higher because of um, there is a little bit more sunshine on the average on the North Sea. That is, um, uh, for instance, uh, shown here in this uh, satellite data, where you can see uh, offshore we have uh, more than uh, 1,100 um, uh, kilowatt hours uh, uh, per year per square meter, a little bit more than on land. And um, now we could also think of uh, the cooling effect of uh, the, the seawater on the PV modules. Um, this is the temperature of the North Sea, the surface temperature in a, in a very hot uh, period. And the, te the surface temperature of the North Sea does not uh, get above uh, 16 degrees, even in a very hot uh, period. So if you could benefit from this um, cooling effect, then the yield of the PV panels uh, could be better than on land. But, 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 uh, there are also uh, very big challenges if you want to go offshore. Um, technical issues, but they also 
you know, always uh, come down to cost. Um, in the end, of course, uh, an offshore PV installation needs to be profitable. Uh, in the end, we would like uh, to um, swim into a sea of uh, money if we have uh, offshore PV. But uh, the OPEX and CAPEX uh, cost of uh, offshore PV are, uh, as, uh, at the moment, um, as we foresee it, uh, quite uh, more higher than on land. Um, if you look at um, some uh, typical, well, the most important um, components uh, for the OPEX and CAPEX and compare land with offshore, we start with the materials and, and construction. On land, uh, we are facing quite uh, small mechanical loads, which allows uh, for, for simple constructions and also the cheapest uh, PV uh, panels, which are based on, on single glass. Uh, offshore, we are facing uh, uh, very harsh uh, conditions, so you need to adopt your, your materials and your construction to these harsh conditions uh, of wind and uh, waves and, and salt. And above that, you also need uh, a kind of mooring, so that is uh, additional cost uh, with respect to land-based systems. Uh, another component in the CAPEX uh, cost and, uh, is the transport and installation of the system. Now, on land, especially in, in a densely populated country like the Netherlands, uh, all sites are easy uh, uh, connectable, so you, transport is easy. And moreover, you can do the installation part by part at the moment that you want to do it. Offshore, um, yeah, you are far away from uh, the land and you want to do a quick rollout of a larger part of the system in once. You very much depend on the weather conditions, which makes it uh, also quite more expensive. Then um, grid connection. In the, yeah, in the country like the Netherlands, the grid is always nearby. Uh, but yeah, we see an increasing number of uh, bottleneck locations because uh, not uh, everywhere the, the grid is strong enough to uh, incorporate uh, large new uh, PV plants. So that's for I made this uh, orange. Uh, but uh, offshore, we are always far from the grid. So you need uh, quite expensive uh, cable to get uh, the power on land. Probably, or maybe, we can share some of the infrastructure to bring power to land with uh, wind parks. But that is still, well, to be seen. Um, operation and maintenance. Well, here again, as for installation, there's always uh, easy access and uh, possible replacement of components uh, for land-based systems. Where offshore, you must concentrate uh, the maintenance in small portions because uh, the, the travel from land to the location offshore is very uh, costly and also not always possible in, uh, due to weather conditions. Uh, at the end of uh, the life of the system, you need to do commissioning, decommissioning. Well, that is of course um, similar to uh, the installation cost. Um, offshore, you might be also be faced with um, say corrosion and fouling uh, issues, which are quite uh, severe which make, uh, can make uh, the, the dismantling of the system more complicated, unknown. Um, then the site lease. So the cost to uh, rent uh, the land or the, the space on which you want to install your system. Well, that is becoming more and more expensive in densely populated areas in, in the Netherlands, of course. Offshore, well, it's uh, very unknown what the cost will be, um, but it's might be or probably is lower than say on land. And finally, the ecological uh, measures. So the measures that are needed to uh, prevent, uh, uh, to, to uh, take care of the ecology of the system. Well, there's a, a lot unknown yet, but on land there is uh, already a huge um, amount of ongoing research on the ecological effects and how to deal with, with that. Offshore, this is uh, very unknown yet. Uh, we can foresee, or there is a possible shadow effect on um, 
the sea life on uh, on the water. Um, but that is un unknown yet. That has to be investigated. For sure, it is important to use uh, environmentally uh, friendly materials which do not leach out uh, poisonous uh, uh, gases or liquids uh, to the sea. Okay, um, well, now I will briefly present uh, the Blue Water Geinop TNO concept as we uh, develop it in the Solar Sea uh, uh, project. Um, this is a, a concept which is uh, quite different from uh, common approaches uh, in which we want to tackle some of um, uh, the main issues uh, which have been mentioned uh, in this uh, in the previous uh, slide. Um, first, um, about materials and construction. So the concept uh, that we are working out is based on the uses of lightweight and flexible floater materials. So they are um, well based on the idea of um, uh, materials that are used for, for supping. Uh, they are inflatable and they are very light and uh, flexible. On that, um, we will add PV, which is lightweight and flexible too. So the, we use uh, thin film, lightweight, flexible PV modules. And in order to prevent uh, the structures from, from blowing away in the wind, we need uh, some stabilization um, things. And for that, we were inspired by, by um, the water bags that, that are used in, in live crafts. So we will make a similar construction using um, water bags underneath uh, these, these floaters. So, um, apart from the electronic uh, components, we will not use uh, any metals. So we will not have any corrosion. But um, yeah, instead of uh, the nailing, we do gluing. And that is an important uh, uh, part of uh, the research that we carry out in this project and it's carry out at TNO. Uh, we have to investigate how to attach uh, the PV modules and the, and the water bags under the floaters by, by gluing and So we are investing several adhesion materials to that uh, as uh, the materials as they come, but also after uh, salt spraying test and after climate uh, chamber test. So to be sure that uh, they keep um, the adhesion for, uh, well, say 25 years. Um, we also look at uh, the mooring of the system. And that is uh, done in collaboration with, with Marin. And um, well, the design of a mooring has to take uh, into account the three types of uh, loads. First is the wind load. And we expect that to be quite small for our PV panels since uh, we have them flat uh, orientated and just above the water surface. So they will not uh, catch uh, much water. Um, second load is uh, the current load. So the tidal uh, the flow, uh, which is very location specific. And uh, thirdly, there's the, the wave load. And uh, at the moment, um, yeah, we are more focusing on the uh, loads um, uh, as, as being um, made by the, by the waves. And um, we do this together with, with Marin and we have made um, uh, some one to 40 scale models. A uh, rule of thumb for inlight, inland uh, water-based systems is uh, 30 mooring lines per what, uh, megawatt peak. That's quite a lot. And, and we thought, uh, can we do with less? Well, uh, we have made uh, yeah, uh, several uh, small scale models. And this is uh, uh, showing two of them. They are cylindrical. So we call them the donut uh, model. Uh, the left one is, um, well, on the real size would uh, be 60 meters and would uh, be uh, uh, an installed uh, power of uh, half a megawatt peak. And if we um, yeah, do this, these tests uh, in the basins of Marin and simulate uh, the North Sea waves, it seems like um, the mooring with uh, three mooring lines would uh, be sufficient to um, yeah, have this uh, system, keep the system in place. So that is uh, encouraging. Um, then um, installation. 
Wim, uh, just to remind you of the time. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, okay. I will speed up a little. Extra time, uh, so this. Uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Slow it, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Um, okay, installation. So here we are inspired by nature. We would follow typically a two step approach. So, so first, create a kind of a web and fix this uh, web with, with word lines, and then fill this web in the second phase with the floaters and uh, with the PV panels uh, on top of that. So then you would have, well, in the, in the rectangular configuration, would end up uh, with a system like this. So a two-step approach. Um, okay. Then, uh, well, the transport and installation. Here we are inspired by the carpet industry. So we would typically um, transport the floaters like a carpet and roll out uh, the carpets uh, like, uh, well, <laughs> like for instance, the Wimbledon rain mats, but then without uh, all these uh, guys uh, pulling on it, uh, but uh, mechanically. Um, yeah, so for uh, op uh, operation and maintenance, uh, we do um, a lot of uh, degradation tests. So to select uh, the robust uh, materials and components, we uh, look at uh, anti-fouling measures to protect uh, the PV modules. And we're also investigating the usage of, um, well, for instance, uh, Velcro uh, to be able to uh, uh, remove or to replace the PV modules uh, in the, when, if they would be damaged. Um, well, this is an example of uh, experience that we carry out to uh, investigate the degradation of uh, PV modules. Uh, under the say deformation that they would uh, see if they would uh, be on a flexible floater in the North Sea. Well, these deformations would not be as large as uh, shown in this uh, video, but still they would face uh, millions of uh, deformations, small deformations in the order of a centimeter. And um, that is uh, investigated by us. We also carry out fouling tests. That is done in the harbor of Den Helder to uh, look at um, well how the modules um, would um, uh, yeah get fouled. Uh, main uh, issue, of course, is the fouling on the surface. So we are looking at that and trying to um, reduce that uh, fouling. Uh, we are also looking at um, fouling uh, underwater. This is basically harmless because uh, the fouling is, has the same uh, say weight as the, the seawater, but it could be an issue if you want to take uh, the floaters out of the water again later. Um, we have an issue with uh, with geese in a, a, a small demo site uh, at, uh, at the Weber polder. So we have there installed a, a one kilowatt uh, peak system. Uh, near a uh, Groenleven site. And uh, for some reasons, uh, the geese there in this environment, uh, they like our demo very much. So we have installed uh, pins now, here and here and here, uh, to prevent uh, these birds. Well, this is of course also very location dependent. We don't expect uh, these geese uh, to be present in the North Sea, but it's a uh, kind of, yeah, it's a possible thing of uh, concern. Um, well, the final objective uh, of the TKI project is to install next year uh, a 50 kilowatt peak system in the Oostvoorns and Meer. This site will be discussed in the, in the presentation later on. Um, and uh, well, this would uh, contain uh, four floaters of uh, 7 by 15 square meters, and each uh, floater would uh, have 10 PV modules on it. Um, so that is uh, to be installed uh, next year. Wim, and, uh, we're now at the uh, end of the time slot. Uh, I'm not sure if you want to show many more slides, but... No, this is the very last one. The very last one, okay. So this is our dream. So there we want to uh, come, uh, well, uh, sooner or later, but uh, hopefully soon, uh, that we have uh, yeah, uh, a real uh, production system uh, on the North Sea, and hopefully it would be possible to uh, locate that uh, in between a, a wind park 
And this is a, a possible configuration. So it's, it's again this uh, donut type uh, system. Uh, it would have a size of uh, with a diam diameter of uh, about 400 uh, meters, yeah. and it would have uh, uh, say capacity of four megawatt peak. So this is a visualization of how this could look like. And with that, um, yeah. Uh, sorry, I took uh, a little no, bit no, of time. Uh, we have to uh, make make up, but I just want to to uh, take maybe uh, thirty seconds to uh, to answer a question from the audience. Uh, a question from Ajit, uh, who asks, won't thin film solar panels mean a much lower solar efficiency? No, that's not true. They are, have some uh, lower efficiency, but uh, the, the solar panels that we are using now have an efficiency of uh, 16 to 18 uh, percent, which is very close to uh, commercial crystalline silicon uh, modules with an efficiency of 20 percent. Okay, yeah. well, that's... Uh... Thanks for answering that and thanks for a uh, very interesting presentation and despite all the challenges you mentioned, we're all working very hard ahead to make it happen. Uh, uh, and um, so we're moving on to the next uh, presentation. If you can stop sharing your screen, Wim. Um, uh, then uh, we're moving on to, uh, to Philip uh, Drontman, um, who will talk about the Field Lab uh, Green Economy West Forne that you just uh, hinted on. Uh, Philip, um, the floor is yours. Yes, here I am. I want to... Yes, the slides are visible. Yes, is it visible? Can you Absolutely. hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, as Wim just mentioned, uh, uh, there will be a project at the Oostvorns Meer, uh, a testing uh, pilot uh, location. And um, I, I like to tell something about that location and where we are already. Uh, my name is Fido Dotman. I'm coordinating the Field Lab Green Economy uh, West Forne. Um, and I will, you, I will give you an impression of uh, what we have done the last, uh, last years and where, are, where we are now. It's also an invitation to, to come along, to come to with the Oostvorns Meer. Uh, because where are we located? We have already pointed out that we are located in the north uh, west uh, point of the Oostvorst Meer, so near the Maasvlakte 2 and uh, the island of Forne Putte. Um, so we, there are we located. If you look to more detail, then you'll see here a picture of the location, the, the Field Lab Green Economy West Forne. As you see, it's green. <laughs> uh, uh, um, at the, at the uh, you see also the uh, fossil uh, industry and as field lab green economy we want to uh, develop alternatives uh, for our energy production um, you see two cabins uh, there uh, one of them is from TNO and the other is from the municipal uh, gemeente West Vorne uh, this lake uh, is used as a recreation uh, lake, so you have surfers, swimmers, uh, divers, diving. Uh, you see there an, a, a white spot, that's a diving location. So we have to, uh, we have a test location in an, a natural environment. Um, the field lab, some facts, uh, we have a field lab, it's a test location. Uh, so we will not have a production of uh, solar energy uh, at the Oostvorms Meer. It's, it's, uh, it's a field lab a test location. It's focused on the green economy. So we want to develop an alternative. And it's located in West Forne, on the island of Forne Putte. And the location wants to have uh, to, 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 to provide a regional benefits. It started in 20, uh, 2017. Uh, it takes a, a quite a long period to get it where it's now. Um, and I already said it's test location near the Oostvorst Meer and the water's breakage 
It is a former river uh, and the depth is about 30 meters, 40 meters. So we have to deal with that. Okay, uh, the focus of this field lab, green economy, is energy and water. So it's all about energy and water. And you see here the sun is shining. It starts all with the sun. And um, we have an, yeah, our location, our field lab, um, specialized on, on this, uh, on this uh, team. Um, we have now one project and we are of course interested in more projects uh, at this field lab at this location. Uh, our first client is TNO um, and uh, with TNO of uh, TNO is uh, wants to uh, uh, develop a project which is called Zon op Water and uh, what I found interesting is that to to get this done, you uh, you need uh, you need participation participation of many many partners. So it's it's done. Uh, it can only be done with the cooperation of uh, all kind of partners. Uh, this is how it looks now. Uh, it's real. It's no and. Uh, you see again at the right side the, the field lab location, uh, a large ponton which gives entrance to the to the field lab, to 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 the to, to, to the to the floating systems, and uh, you you see that three uh, uh, systems uh, from three different providers. Uh, at the end of last year, we we uh, did how do you call that? We uh, we had twelve. Uh, companies who were interested uh, to get their installation tested and uh, three were selected uh, you see the the the, the round uh, the circle uh, which is turns with the sun it's come from from uh, from portugal then the the square on the left side uh, it's quite fixed it comes from spain and at the right side and uh, totally new developed developed uh, system it's come from the company company from Tessel, so from the Netherlands. So we have an international, uh, we have uh, international combination of, of companies. Um, and um, this is in October, so it, it's quite new. And um, the next slide. Uh, I want to point out that it all, just as it's on sea, also here at the near shore, uh, the grid connection is essential. And uh, you, you have to know that there was no grid connection at all at this uh, field lab. So it has to be built especially for this field lab. Uh, and it took us a great effort to realize that. Uh, we get uh, very good support from Staden in this. Uh, and uh, in the beginning of this year, in February, it was uh, all uh, ready. So we are very thankful to uh, Staden. This is the entrance uh, point. And uh, if you want to get a look uh, uh, yourself, uh, feel free. You can uh, drive to this location uh, and see uh, from a distance, in fact, the, the, the different uh, solar islands. See so some more pictures. Uh, on, the, on the left side, uh, there you see again the Portuguese uh, 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 island. It's very flexible. It's, uh, it's uh, turning with the sun. And you see a yeah, boundary uh, for the waves. Uh, and uh, William knows all about this. He calculated and uh, everything. So uh, technical information I want to, uh, to uh, suggest to get in contact with William. On the right side, you see the, the TESOL uh, system. It's quite open. Uh, it's, it, it's more and more stiff. Um, and interesting is that of course, also one of the issues is the, uh, the environmental uh, impact. And we had, uh, there is an, 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 uh, part of the, this pilot will be in research from uh, the Applied Science uh, University of, 
Zeeland in uh, Middelburg. And they um, will uh, do the research on the water quality and the environmental impact. So on the, on the, on the, on the you see further on or more technical sides, uh, the, the power stations and the all kind. Uh, what I found interesting that all kind of business this is creating and uh, all kind of suppliers are needed to, to get it done. So it's really a totally new economy and uh, with many challenges, but therefore also interesting. So uh, no. good for the business. Okay, what's the next steps? Uh, we want to uh, full commission of the three systems. Um, that will be, uh, that is starting from now. And uh, the next year we will, uh, there will be monitoring of one year on the electric performance uh, and the reliability, the, 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 the mechanical tech dynamics. And as I said, the water quality parameters. These are the partners of this uh, project. So without these people, it wasn't, uh, uh, it wasn't uh, accomplished. Um, so, and I, as last, I want to share you three yeah, key factors of success. Or uh, uh, the, um, first of all, I think that is the vision. Uh, uh, what do you want? Uh, what is your, your vision for the future? Uh, as a field lab, we choose for a sustainable uh, field lab uh, focus on, uh, on water and energy. And it helps us, this focus helps us. Um, secondly, the co-creation. So uh, you need all kinds of experts to, to get it realized. Um, and uh, so the combination of, of, of organizations is a key uh, and a good cooperation of these people is a key uh, factor of success. And as la last word, uh, persistence. Uh, to get this done, we, uh, we started in 2017 uh, from scratch and uh, it took a so long time that uh, uh, and also myself that I thought, will, did, uh, will we at the end realize uh, anything? But after all, it, uh, it, we succeeded. And uh, yeah, I'm really proud uh, that we uh, have done that. So uh, I will finish. Um, if you want to see more, uh, please uh, let me know. And you, we like to invite you at the Oostvoorzemeer. We can tell you more. Uh, Jan Kroon is also in this uh, webinar, and uh, Marcel Westerhout uh, from the Municipal Gemeente Westvoorde is also here. So we can uh, we like to uh, tell more about it, uh, and you can come along yourself. There's a website, Field Lab, and that's it. Yeah, that's what I want to say. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thing and hope for the we will meet uh, at the at the Field Lab. Uh, at the shore. Well, thanks very much, uh, Philip. That's, uh, that's interesting. This is really happening uh, now in West Forne. Um, looking at the chat, if there were any uh, questions, um, I think we've answered all questions up to now, so there are no additional questions. Uh, maybe it's a question for you because uh, you already have uh, three occupants now uh, at your site. Uh, uh, you can cater for more. Is, is there space enough for more uh, uh, experiments and, and test setups? Uh, yes, uh, there is a space for more. Um, of, co uh, uh, of course, we want to first uh, uh, get this done uh, the, the, the first year, but there is room for more. And also, we want to, what is interesting for us is also the uh, energy storage on land. So we have a, a place with land and water. Um, so if there is a, if anybody who has uh, an idea of a pilot project for energy storage, that would be interesting for uh, for, the, for would be for the field lab. It would be additional to what we have. Yeah, and, and of good. course, uh, this project is for this year for one year. So say to the end of uh, 21, uh, 2021. And after that, uh, uh, this uh, so all these installations uh, will be. Uh, how do you say that? Uh, disappear or will be moved? 
and uh, so new projects uh, uh, are welcome and we have an agreement with the TNO to uh, uh, to work for the coming five years together. Okay. Well, uh, thanks again for uh, the presentation, uh, Philip. Um, just checking if there are more questions. Uh, yes, there is a question. Um, what are the conditions to put any floating PV structure uh, to the field lab? What are the conditions? I'm not sure, but it could be like terms and conditions, financial conditions maybe, or... Um, no, it's, in fact, it's, uh, we have no conditions. Now, it's the, 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 mo the, the most important condition is that, uh, that you bring your own money. <laughs> <laughs> And that you and that it has uh, uh, it contributes to the green economy of West Forna. So you have to deliver your green power to the grid for free, or do you get compensated? Or no, you don't get compensated. Uh, <laughs> so there is no the uh, 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 the costs are low uh, to come there. Uh, uh, we will uh, there's an, uh, oh, uh, you you get warm welcome. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, for us, important is that it adds to the green economy, and uh, that you bring your own funds to to get it all uh, realized. Yeah. Can I can I make an addition or? Am, am... Yes, of course, Jan. Yeah, yeah. yeah so I'm, I'm Jan from Tino, so I'm, I'm managing the, this 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 project together with uh, with Field Lab. But of course, if there are uh, in, if there is interest to uh, for an for a pilot project, uh, this can be done in several ways. It can be business to business, but it could also be be integrated into a new subsidy project or whatever. So there are several ways to to organize a a, a pilot or whatever. Uh, because this project that was just mentioned by Philip is also a a, a project that is financed by Tino, by, by partners like Sabik and Equinor, and that there are several ways to organize a new pilot. So when, whenever a, system, a, a party or an, an, an MKB is interested to participate, they can, they can approach us, of course. Thank you, Thanks for that yeah. uh, addition, Jan. That, uh, so um, uh, I hope that answers uh, Sebastian's uh, question for uh, the conditions, so you can always get in touch uh, with uh, with Jan uh, or um, uh, of course with Philip uh, on this. Um, uh, now the, for the last uh, presentation, but not least, we have uh, Allard van Hoeken of uh, Oceans of Energy. Of course, we're very interested to hear Allard what's happening on your side and what are the next steps uh, for the future. The floor is yours. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. And uh, let me start sharing my screen. So thanks a lot for all the speakers and thanks for uh, inviting me here. And uh, let me tell you about um, our first year of operation in the North Sea. Um, so the rationale of offshore solar has already been explained shortly, but uh, it's just that uh, solar doesn't always fit on land, especially in densely populated coastal areas like the Netherlands. Uh, we see quickly uh, space constraints. Uh, right now we are just a few percentage of our total energy contribution in renewables. And we already see uh, uh, all kinds of issues with land usage. And at the same time, there's a lot of space at sea. So that's the area we're, we're aiming for with offshore solar. Also interesting to see the combination with uh, offshore solar and offshore wind. And I think one of the main figures I want to to, uh, to give you as a takeaway is that it's not just a few percentage of additional energy that you can create. We're really talking about uh, up to five times more energy in energy per year per square kilometer. So that's a huge uh, increase in the total energy output uh, of the same area at sea. And uh, the significance is also shown if you look at our total energy usage in the Netherlands. Uh, it's about 3,300 3, petrojoules per year. Uh, 550 is, is um, loss in conversion uh, from uh, fossil fuels to electricity. So we don't need to generate that if we already generate electricity. Another 550 is uh, uh, petrochemical usage. So 2,200 petrojoules per year, that's what we need. And then if you look at onshore wind, 
that is now uh, around four gigawatts. That's 2% of this total energy uh, usage per year. And onshore solar, uh, well, today it's about five gigawatts. It can go up to around 50. That would mean 8% uh, of our total energy demand. Well, assume there's other renewable resources on land, like uh, geothermal, uh, then you can, on land, you can go up to around 20%. Now, offshore wind is a huge, uh, made huge progress, uh, really impressive. So in the best uh, projections, there's around 60 gigawatt peak, that's around 30%. So now we have 50% uh, of all our energy generated, but we also have used a lot of uh, space uh, and we have all the offshore wind. So where does the other half come from? Well, offshore solar really can fulfill that, uh, that promise that we can really generate 50% of our total energy consumption. And for that, we need around 5% of the Dutch sector of the North Sea. And the 60 gigawatt of wind would consume around 18%, 20%. So the 5% can actually go within that 20% if you, do, uh, if you aim for co-usage. So this is really promising. And uh, I'd like to show you a little video. Uh, see if I can make that work. I need to stop share and share again of uh, how that combination could look like. Yeah, so here you see a uh, wind farm. And then if we uh, go a little bit uh, up with the camera, you see there's offshore solar now situated between the wind turbines. So the wind turbines are around uh, a kilometer and a half apart from each other. And now we have made squares of one square kilometer in between the wind turbines and those we can, uh, those are uh, solar. And we left 500 meters wide corridors here as an assumption. So that's the starting point. So this is our vision of uh, offshore energy farms. And uh, let me go back to the, where is the meeting? Okay, I stop share, yeah. So um, another important advantage is the, uh, the different timing of the output. So in the, in the winter, there's of course more offshore wind, but in summertime, there's more solar. So if you combine the two, you will get a more continuous power coming from the sea to the land. And up to a certain amount, you can also share the same uh, cable. So where are we now? Um, so our, our system was installed in November 2019, the first uh, modules that you see here in the picture. It was expanded to uh, 50 kilowatts in this year, and we've seen some really rough seas and large uh, storms, including the early this year in Chiara and uh, Dennis. Uh, so that was uh, exciting, and the system which did all of this very well. It stayed uh, intact and it, uh, it dealt with all those uh, storms. Uh, the system itself, it's a floating system, it's anchored, uh, we can use any distance to shore. Um, it's very scalable, so the modules that you saw, those are our full-size modules uh, that we have now out on the sea and we want to, uh, we can use, we are using the same modules for the bigger farms. Um, we have integrated PV panels and uh, we tested at Marin in the offshore basin to 30 meter maximum wave height. And uh, well, I think one of the attractions of, of your solar is the, the maintenance. There's no moving parts in the, in the power generation. So that's really cool. No gearboxes, no oil consuming uh, equipment. And also the access is quite near sea level. You don't need to go 130 meters up to access anything. So those are some attractive points of, of your solar. Here we see a recent picture of our farm. And uh, yeah, I think one of the main things also to notice is just the vast amount of seawater around uh, the system. So we have done some tracking of the wind speed. Here you see the, the wind speed of the, over the year. And you see that, uh, yeah, we've gone over 100 kilometers per hour of uh, forces. Those were those storms that I mentioned earlier on. And the wave uh, system, uh, so we have seen uh, just over four meters significant wave height. Uh, so that's uh, close to eight meters maximum wave uh, until now. 
So one of the core things we all want to do is also we do a lot of uh, research. This is a paper with University of Utrecht um, that have concluded that they would expect 13% uh, more yield coming from the sea. Half of this is uh, from higher solar radiance and half of this from better cooling. And um, as I said, the research is really, really key. We started from day one uh, with uh, yeah, investigating what is the impact of what we are doing? Um, what is the, uh, yeah. And there's actually, and we expect uh, a lot of positive impact. So here we do some sampling underneath the uh, floaters. This resulted in a, a paper that just came out uh, where we see the, the, the impacts and the benefits. So uh, one of the most serious potential impacts is uh, the shading of the sea. Um, this is a picture of phytoplanktons. Well, they're very important. They are the basics of all the food. Everything that lives in the sea basically eats uh, or, or somehow thrives on phytoplankton. They are at the bottom of the food chain. So they're really important. And uh, luckily, uh, we see that the effect of our of a system, even of a few percentage of the North Sea uh, covered with floating solar, is still uh, negligible. And the main reason is because and this is the paper that came out of it. The main reason is that the seawater is always in movement. So you can imagine that the, um, yeah, that the, the water is uh, outside of the system and then for a while it's underneath the system. So that's the moment it's not getting the sunlight. But when it flows out, it gets sunlight again. So that's different from an inland system where the water is, more, uh, is, is not moving and the impact of solar is, can be more severe. But at sea, this is uh, quite negligible. This paper and model up to 20% is not a problem. And I already mentioned that with 5% of the Dutch sector, we already have supplied half of the energy of the Netherlands. So uh, it's, uh, this looks good. And it's also, it's, uh, yeah, something. So that, that's one really important thing. One of the benefits is if as soon as you put something in the water, it's going to attract uh, life. Uh, that's very well known. Um, and uh, here you see that, uh, well, it, it attracts life, it attracts fish, but there's also hard substrates um, that's going to live underneath the floaters, etc. So if we look at the overall, uh, so where we are now is that the uh, potential negative uh, effects are expected to be low. And uh, yeah, we're doing studies on all these topics. And uh, also very important to note that this is not where it stops. We want to continue monitoring. So every step we're going to make, we need to keep on monitoring and looking in the future, what is the impact? Uh, for me personally, this is also very important. If this, uh, yeah, I'm really passionate about the sea. I'm passionate about the ocean. So I don't want to do anything that would harm the, this environment. So, um, but I'm very happy to see that for the time being, this looks like very, very positive for nature because you really offer opportunities, which you see on the right side uh, for fish, artificial reef, yeah, for a lot of life. So it's positive for nature and positive for people. So clean energy. Um, also interesting that half of the world population lives uh, within 100 kilometers from, uh, from the sea. So uh, it can have a really big positive impact on the planet. So we're working towards uh, a cost decrease. Of course, every new technology always has the challenge that uh, in the beginning, you're always more expensive and uh, you need volume to become cheaper, but you need to be cheaper to get volume. So that's always a difficult dilemma. Uh, we, uh, we have already achieved a more rapid cost decrease over the, our first project than we would have uh, expected. And our applications, um, what, where we see our product use. So it's uh, on the right side, I already mentioned the large scale wind farms, the combination is just very, it offers a lot of attractive uh, advantages. And on the smaller scale, we see uh, all the remote place, uh, islands and the remote locations. Typically they have not enough space on an island. Uh, and even if they have like here, what you see happening here, you see this more often, if you look at pictures from island that get solar farms, you see that they cut trees. So I don't think the idea that you make a better planet is by cutting trees and putting in solar panels. Whilst if you would have this solar farm floating outside of the island in the sea, that would be uh, much more interesting. 
So our conclusions from one year uh, operation at sea. So first of all, offshore solar in high waves, it is possible. And this is really the major point that we really wanted to achieve with our first, first project is uh, yeah, really getting this done because it was not done anywhere before, not in, in high waves. And our project offered a very good learning curve in terms of how to uh, deal with system, how to deploy it, how to expand it, how to inspect it, how to operate and maintain it. And it also offered a very good cost reduction curve already. Uh, also important that we try to do installation, not the offshore way, uh, but really to try to, to use very simple vessels and very simple means to get uh, stuff at location. And that worked out very well. And um, I already mentioned the expected higher yield. Uh, so we, we are in a project with the University of Utrecht that's going to take a bit more time to get the real data from the modeling, it looks good. And uh, I also agree that the main driver for offshore shoulder is, is actually space. Uh, that's really uh, that's really the main thing, and it's uh, just a bonus if the energy yield is higher. Environmental impact, I already mentioned, it's very important, and uh, this is why we do a lot of activity in the research on this. And it's expected mostly positive, well, uh, little negatives. And uh, yeah, very very uh, key for the next few years is that we get the supply chain involved. So I'm I'm really happy to see uh, other parties active in getting offshore solar or solar and salt water uh, installed. So we need PV modules that are uh, seawater approved, uh, inverters, cables, connectors, etc. So I don't know how many investors we have in the group, but uh, of course we are a young company, so always looking for investment, convertible loans and equity. And uh, I want to thank really our, our partners with a large group of partners. And it's uh, very exciting to work together in this new space at sea. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's really uh, nice to work together with so many good companies and good people. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Alex, for uh, an interesting presentation. And it's really happening. And it's good to see experience being built up, learning by doing but also all the scientific research that goes into these projects. That's uh, really very good. And uh, we got some questions from the audience. Uh, so if you can stay with us for a couple of minutes. Um, question from Jan Paul. Uh, what do you consider as most critical, wind or waves? Uh, I'm assuming this is about the loads on the systems. Yeah, it's definitely the waves for our system. Yeah. I think that uh, aligns, of course, with uh, the presentation of William uh, already in the, in the beginning. Yeah. And um, that's uh, taking up the loads uh, is uh, still an important design uh, criterion. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's another question um, from uh, Michael. Uh, how do uh, the expected cost for offshore solar compare to the cost of other electricity sources, such as offshore wind? Uh, you've shown the graph. I think there is a kind of a cutoff. Yeah, that, that's the graph that I showed. Uh, but in words, it's, it's actually the same. So, of course, right now we're pretty, uh, we're, bit, we're more expensive than offshore wind. Although I must say from earlier developments that I did, we are already quite uh, in a competitive area for, for, some, for some locations and not for grid parity, but for some locations we are already good. So the starting point is quite low for something new that's in the sea. Uh, um, and I, I expect offshore solar to become uh, below the cost of offshore wind. And um, yeah, because well, one of the few things that I can mention is, is the, the, the O and M cost. Uh, no rotating parts, um, easy access, easy inspection. Uh, yeah, we already use drones. We, we, we it's it's quite, a, it's very. Really, I think it's very friendly to operate in the sea, uh, relative, especially relative to wind. So I'm not really uh, involved in offshore wind operations, but when I look go 130 meters high, and if I see all the gear in in a windmill, uh, including cranes, and well, there's so much that offshore solar doesn't need. So I think we can go below the cost of offshore wind. Yeah, absolutely. That's very promising. And of course, with the enormous potential in terms of generating capacity, that's really good news for the energy transition. So lower cost and enormous volumes. Uh, yeah. Uh, there's more questions uh, coming now in the, in the chat. Let me, let me just add to that that I also believe in the combination. Eh? So I, yeah, I really of think course. that offshore solar, offshore wind, the combination is very good. But also combinations of, uh, say, knowledge development. Eh? You, you mentioned, for example, uh, the, the use of drones. 
Now, of course, that's also very beneficial for uh, offshore wind uh, inspections and, uh, and maybe even maintenance activities. So there's a lot of alignment there, I think, uh, yeah. and, and also learning from each other. Yeah. Um, there's a question uh, from uh, Ajit. How many years will the solar panels operate in an offshore installation? So lifetime. Uh... Well, our starting point is 25 years uh, for an offshore farm to operate. But then you can easily tow them uh, back to shore and, uh, and replace them. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Or even keep them there and keep them operating longer. Yeah. You just, you just need to have a, a reasonable starting point. And uh, I think for off onshore projects on land is typically 15 years or 1.5. I think offshore wind typically 20, 25 years as well. Yeah. It's the, 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 so the current wind farms are 20, 25 years, but uh, also the, the permits are now being extended uh, in the direction of 40 years. And so also new designs will have to be made to, uh, to cover that lifetime. Um, there's a question from uh, Edward. Uh, uh, how interested are offshore wind uh, park operators to collaborate? Uh, well, they are interested to uh, collaborate. They're interested to find out what offshore solar is about. And um, of course, the, 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 one of the challenges for us is that the wind, wind already is, is uh, six, eight years ahead of us. So their main worry is, our, is their next wind project and, and the tendering of that. Um, but I think we really made a big step by proving that the system is, is at sea, that it works. And uh, yeah, it's, it's for them something, um, yeah, early phase on one side, but I also see that they recognize the potential. So it's something that they definitely uh, are keeping an eye on. And, um, yeah, I think it's good what, what already happened already once. I think it needs to keep on going. That also from the tendering, the offshore wind tendering, it needs to be uh, really uh, pushed for this combination of offshore wind and offshore solar. And um, so there are some things that the, that the government can also do to, to really make this happening. Also, the electricity law is something that's right now only allowing offshore wind electricity to be transported to the land. So there's a change of law needed. Um, I'm sure that at the time they, they, they thought about this law, they were not thinking about uh, <laughs> offshore solar. A bit of some of the things that we need to go through. So I think if the, the bigger the push from, uh, from the tendering from the, from the government to, to see this combination, because it is in the benefit of all, if you have less uh, space at sea needed to, or, or you generate more power, uh, this is really uh, in everybody's interest. Yeah. So there's, there's a, a last question before we wrap up uh, from, from Tessa. What are your next steps? Uh... So the next step is, uh, is ex expand this system to a one megawatt uh, size. And then the next step is 10 megawatt. And the next step after is 100 megawatt. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> it's and, as uh, simple as that. Uh, yeah. Very good. Well, uh, thanks a lot for, uh, for your presentation, uh, Allard. Uh, and um, we'll start now to, to wrap up this, uh, this session. Um, uh, I'll share my screen for the last uh, remarks. Um, and uh, of course, we've seen the very interesting presentations. And as I said before, uh, they will be uh, shared with you. Uh, now, it's difficult to give uh, an, uh, an online applause. But uh, uh, again, thanks very much for, uh, for all the effort that went into this uh, and the time that you spent presenting to us. Uh, that is very appreciated. Um, and of course, while listening to uh, all these uh, inspiring talks, you may have uh, some ideas of your own. And um, uh, we want to also leave you with uh, a supporting message from, from Buccaneer, Maritime Delta, and uh, the TKI, or TKIs, I must say. Um, and uh, we can support you in many ways, uh, with accelerated programs, collaboration, uh, but also potentially with uh, innovation subsidies and uh, You'll find contact details on this slide as well. Uh, and don't hesitate to, to get in touch uh, and get involved in, uh, in the innovation programs. Um, and um, I want to thank you very much for, uh, for your attention uh, now. And uh, maybe there is some closing remarks still from, uh, from Tessa or from Ashley. Um, I'm checking if you're not nodding. Uh, okay, then we'll leave it at this uh, and uh, see you at the next uh, event, uh, which is about uh, floating offshore wind. Uh, yes, and before we leave, I think it's in, it's in place to thank you as well, Bob, for uh, moderating this, this session and uh, 
yeah, really looking forward to a dive in uh, Floating Wind. Um, we'll ne still need to uh, set the date, but we'll keep you informed. Okay. Thank you very, Thank you very much. much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Have a great evening. And have a nice evening. Okay. Thanks bye. a lot, Bob, Ashley. Thanks a lot, and all the organizers. Okay. <laughs> bye. bye.